Welcome to another segment of Word of Truth. My name is Pastor Andrew Russell and I'm glad to be here with you once again, televising from Sydney, Australia at the Hoxton Park Seventh Adventist Church. And uh, today I have a special message for us today. It's entitled, God's Compass for Life. God's Compass for Life. I was introduced to this compass as just a young boy. And I want to tell you a little bit about that just to begin with. So uh, my background, I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, there I was born into what was then known as the apartheid regime. Now what that was, was a system of governance that effectively governed in racism. And people were separated from each other based on the color of their skin. Uh, just a really terrible thing that took place in, in South Africa. And so there were basically three groups of people. People were grouped into, in, into three different sections. There was the, uh, the black people or the uh, African natives. Then there were the, the white people. And then there was a group in the middle. Uh, they were mixed and they weren't really white, uh, um, Anglo-Saxon by color, essentially. And they weren't native African, but they were mixed, mostly brown skin, and uh, they were known as coloreds. And that was the class of people that I belonged to. So you could just imagine what that would do to a country. So I grew up in, in an environment before I came to Australia. I grew up in an environment uh, as a child uh, that uh, involved a lot of violence. There was a lot of boycotting against the government. There was a lot of riots that were breaking that broke out. And, uh, and each day brought with it uh, much crime, theft, all kinds of things that, were, that was taking place in South Africa. And so you could imagine my experience. I remember not being able to sit on a park bench because it said whites only. I remember getting on the bus and I couldn't sit on the front seats of the bus because they were reserved for whites only. I remember one day my family took a drive around the famous um, mountain of Cape Town called uh, Table Mountain. And we drove around to the other side where there were the beautiful properties, uh, oceanfront properties and so forth. Very hot day that day, sweltering day. And so uh, my, my father decided that we could maybe perhaps go for a quick dip. Well, that was in a white area. And someone rang the police. And so the police came down to the beach and kicked us off that beach because it belonged uh, to the whites uh, alone. And so that was the environment that I grew up in. I was uh, robbed at a young age, uh, I had my life threatened, I was caught in riots. And, uh, and, and while all of this was going on, I remember coming across what I call God's compass for life uh, in school at the time, at a young age. So it was in school that I learned about God's compass for life. And let me tell you what that is, friends. It's known as the Ten Commandments. It's known as the Holy Law of God. St. Paul in the Bible calls it, calls the uh, God's commandments holy, just, and good. And so that was my introduction uh, uh, to God's compass for life. And, and I, wanna sh I just want to take a moment just to share that with you. I want to read that to you just so you can get a, a very clear idea of uh, what I'm talking about. I believe it's something that many have forgotten about these days. But really this is a, uh, a, a system of governance for morality. In other words, that we may know right from wrong, and we know it through God's Ten Commandments. So let me read that to you just for a moment. Uh, look at, uh, we'll begin with uh, commandment number one. Here in Exodus 20, verse 3, we'll read all the way down to verse 17. And so it begins with, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment says, you shall not make unto you any graven image or carved images, and you will not uh, make that after the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. It goes on to say that you will not bow down to them. You should not bow down to them, nor serve them. And God says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He has this jealous love uh, for his people, for his creation. And he says here, visiting the iniquity or the sins of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and yet showing mercy unto thousands of generations that love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. And the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant or your maidservant or your cattle 
or even the stranger that is within your gates. It says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. It says, God rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or made it holy. Those were the first four commandments. Let me read to you the next six commandments. It says, Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord gives you. It all goes on to say, you shall not kill. Next commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. The next commandment says, you shall not steal. The next commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the last commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And my friends, this is what I learned as a, as a child in, in, in my Christian school um, back in Cape Town, South Africa. Now imagine as, as the, the world around me was playing out in South Africa, the violence, the theft, the crime. South Africa had some of the highest crime rates in the world at the time when the apartheid regime was in force. And as I looked around the world, I began to wonder, because I had learnt something uh, that governed morality, governed what was good, the Ten Commandments. And I couldn't understand why in the world men would be doing the things that they're doing when God has given us a compass for our life. That we may, as a people, do right and do right by each other and as a society and even as a global community thrive in morality. And Jesus spoke of these commandments. He summed them up. I'm going to take you to the book of Luke. And I want you to notice how Jesus summed up these, these commandments here. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And we'll read verse 27. And notice here. It says, And he answered, saying... Now, there was a young man having a conversation with Jesus about this. And uh, Jesus asked him, What's written in the law? And the man responds, and he responds correctly. And it says, And he answered, saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So you will love your Lord your God with all your, all your heart, with all your soul. Love your neighbor also as yourself. Now, Jesus quoted this as well. Jesus also himself said this very thing that this man is, has, um, has said to Jesus. And so, Je so what Jesus here, what Jesus understood was that those ten commandments that we just read are summed up in these two commandments here. In other words, Christ uh, was able to summarize what was in the law. And this man that, was, uh, that said that, he was actually quoting from the Old Testament as well. Because in the Old Testament, it also tells you to love God with all your heart and all your soul. In the Old Testament, it also says to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. And so, how do we love God? Well, that's the first four commandments. How do you love God with all your heart and all your soul? If you love God, well, you won't place anything before Him. Isn't that right? If you truly come to the knowledge of your Creator and honor your Creator, you won't place anything before Him. You'll be thankful, you'll be grateful for the life that He has given you. And if you love God, you wouldn't take His name in vain. You wouldn't blaspheme as so many do today. If you love God, you wouldn't try to misrepresent Him uh, by, by carved images of our own imaginations. And if you look in different civilization and cultures all through time, people have tried to represent God as, as animals and, and all kinds of things, the sphinx and, and elephants. And, and really what man is doing, he's taking creation, that which God created, and he has turned it into idols of worship. But no one can represent the invisible and, uh, and create and this awesome creator uh, with his own hands. And so that's why God says, don't even try to do that. Don't try to represent me with your own ways. Don't make me after your own imagination. And so if we love God, we would do these things. We remember to keep the Sabbath day holy, the day that he rested and he placed aside when in the, in the very beginning in creation. You see, that day was a day for a holy community. That was the day to come together as a people to remember the Creator, to remember the gift of life. And man in the very beginning had eternal life too with God. And God, the Bible tells us that God came in and walked, in, walked amongst man when we read how He walked amongst Adam and Eve. 
And so God loved this community of His creation. And uh, that's the, one of the reasons we go to church. We go there and we go to worship Him and honor Him and we come together as a community of faith, giving thanks. And that adds real meaning to our life. It, it shows us that life is not to ta- be taken for granted. It shows us that life is a gift. Well, that's how you love God, friends, in those first four commandments, when you want to love Him with all your heart and all your soul. The last six commandments is how you love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you won't steal from your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you won't commit adultery with your neighbor's partner. You won't covet your neighbor's wife. You won't covet your neighbor's goods. You won't desire the things that belong to him and keep comparing yourself until it compels you to do something that you really you shouldn't do. If you loved your neighbor, you would, you would honor him, even as it said, honor your mother and your father. And so this is God's compass for our life, and I hope that makes sense to you, because it certainly made sense to me. And so this is what we need, friends, in order to thrive and to find blessing and to, to find meaning and purpose in our life. Because the life that I believe God has given for you to live The life that God desires you to live and the life that He desires me to live is a life of integrity, a life of honesty, a life of purpose, a life where we're not just consumed with our own things, but but we actually take an interest in the well-being of those around us. Isn't that a life really worth living? But we often squander the life that we have. And so we we lose our way, friends, because we do not have God's moral compass in our lives. You know, one of the foolish things I've heard myself, even in the Christian community, is how when Jesus came, he he somehow did away with this moral compass, friends. And, uh, and, And that's just the silliest thing that I've heard. No, if you read the New Covenant, as Paul talks about in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, he says that, that through Christ, God's going to write His law in our hearts, and in our minds. And God wants to do that. Now, the law serves a purpose, friends. I mean, I remember, and let me tell you the story, and I'm going to be very honest with you here, but I remember having a run-in with the law. Have you ever had a run-in with the law? Uh, Perhaps at some time or another, we have all had a run-in with the law. And the run-in I had was I was um, uh, driving down a, a highway or freeway, and the police pulled me over. You know, I was, I was driving along, minding my own business, when I heard that siren in the back. And I, I caught, a, you know, caught sight of these flashing red and blue lights. And so the policeman pulled me over and he came up to my car window. And he said, uh, well, I said to him, is, ev- is everything all right, officer? And he said, well, no, actually. And uh, he said that um, I had been speeding. And I... I didn't believe that I was speeding and I said no I wasn't I I wasn't speeding at all and he said no in fact you were actually doing 20 kilometers above uh, the speed limit for this uh, for the zone from where I caught you and I what I didn't realize I traveled that road every day but I actually sped I actually sped up before the zone where I was supposed to be doing uh, um, in the zone I was supposed to be doing 70 kilometers an hour, I sped up before that, before the 90 kilometer zone. So I was actually doing 90 in the 70 kilometer zone before I hit the 90 kilometer zone. Well, it was just habit me driving there and, and thinking I'm coming to that area where I start to speed up. But anyway, he pulls me over and he says to me, no, the 90 kilometer zone starts, started over here. And in fact, you've been speeding. And I just thought, oh, what do I do? And so I looked at him and I said to him, uh, I, it was a mistake, officer. I, in, in all innocence, it was my ignorance and I didn't realize. And, and please believe me, I'm not a hoon. Now, that's an Australian word. A hoon is a colloquial term for hooligan. A hooligan that s- likes to speed and, and drive recklessly. And so anyway, he acknowledged what I said and he went back to his police car with my driver's license and you know, punched some things into his little computer there in his police car and then he came back to me and he said to me, your record seems to tell me otherwise. Oh, what could I do? You see, I used to work in sales and I was on the road all the time and I'd acquired all these, these, these tickets and, and you know, doing 65 in a 60k zone and so forth and, and I had this bit of a record there. And so when he 
said that to me, what could I say? Guilty as charged. Isn't that right? What could I say? My record was there. And friends, uh, I want you to know that when we look into God's Ten Commandments, we also get a sense of our record. And I want you to see how Jesus brings us out in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus brings us out um, and he helps us to understand exactly um, the purpose of the law. And notice here in Matthew chapter 5, he speaks of these Ten Commandments. And he says, and he's quoting from these commandments now, and he says, You have heard that it was said of them by, uh, of old time, You shall not kill. Remember that commandment, which I read to you before? And it says, And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But Jesus said, But I say unto you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. See what Jesus did there? He said, you know, the commandments, they, they don't necessarily relate just to literally killing or murdering someone. But if you, if you show an, a, an unsanctified temper towards someone, if you're angry with someone without a cause, if you, tr if you mistreat them, well, you're in danger of breaking that commandment. He goes on and he says, you have in verse 27, he says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. And he says, but I say unto you, that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. And what Jesus did was he magnified the law. The Bible says he would come and he would magnify the law and make it honourable. You see, if you have ever taken the Lord's name in vain, we would call that blasphemy. Okay, that's the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. God, your God in vain. That would be blasphemy. If you have ever taken something that didn't belong to you, the commandment says, I shall not steal. And yet you have taken something, you've broken that commandment. If you have ever looked on a woman to lust after her, as Jesus said, you've already broken the commandment that says you shall not commit adultery because of lust. And so, friends, when we look at the commandments, we begin to realize that we are not as good as we think we are. You know, to, to take the name of the Lord in vain is to be a blasphemer. To look at a woman with lust. I mean, how many times perhaps have you done that when you've looked at someone with a lust and you haven't regarded them for the magnificent creature of God's creation that they uh, were made to be. You haven't honoured them but you've broken that commandment. Well, that would make us adulterers, wouldn't it? And if we took something, no matter how small, that didn't belong to us, that would make us thieves. And so by definition, we are adulterers. We are thieves. We are blasphemers. If we've been angry at someone without even a cause, if we've, we've mistreated someone, we are murderers according to the commandment. And God saw what would take place when sin came into the world. He saw what the world would become just like South Africa, the South Africa that I was born into. And the Bible defines sin as breaking God's commandments. I want to share that with you just quickly. It's found in the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And this is what the Bible says. It says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of of God's law. You see, friends, we know evil, we know sin by looking at God's commandments. And only as we look at God's commandments, then we get a true sense of how we have lost our way in this world. And if you were honest with me, you would say that sin never brings blessing. But the evil things that we do, the sin of adultery, the sin of theft, uh, mistreating people, all these things, they only bring suffering to others. And so we find this world in a state of suffering. We find this world in often a state of indifference to the suffering of others. And, uh, and so we have lost our way from God. And so my friends, the, the law that governed how fast I drove on the road was actually a good thing, right? The law serves a good purpose. It, it was to help me to, uh, to be safe on the road. It was to keep others safe. So rather than speed and break that law, um, 
it, it was there to preserve uh, the health and well-being of, of others. And so I shouldn't have done that, even though I did it in my ignorance. And so the policeman, he, he came along and he was just upholding the law. There's nothing wrong with the law of God, friends. It helps, it's, it's there to preserve peace and harmony. It's actually there to preserve love for God and love for our neighbor perfectly. But the Bible says we have now all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when, when Adam and Eve first sinned, as I shared with you in a previous presentation, God foresaw what was going to happen in this world. He saw the murderers. He saw the haters. He saw the pedophiles. He saw the, the, the fraudulent. He saw the vanity. Uh, he saw how people exalted themselves at the expense of others. How the, he saw the poor being oppressed. He saw it all, friends. He saw what would t- take place when man had lost his way from God and from God's way. And so the Bible says that because of that, the wages of sin is death. That's the wages of sin. And if you were honest with me, and we looked around this world, we could say, we can see why. We can see why. But God did something incredible. Rather than destroy the world, He put into effect a plan, which we call the plan of salvation, in which Christ came from heaven to become a substitute for you and for me. He came. And and the Bible speaks of a time when when He hung on Calvary, when He submitted Himself to uh, to the oppressors of the time, to those who had lost their way from God. And as Christ came preaching truth, and preaching the kingdom of God, these oppressors, for the sake of their own greed, and for the sake of their own self-exaltation, and for the sake of their own lusts, persecuted Him and crucified Him, and He allowed Himself to be put to death. In fact, Jesus says, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. And the Bible says, and John describes Jesus in John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There was this divine being called the Word. He was with God, with God the Father. And he says, it was with God. And the Word, he says in verse 14 of John chapter 1, the Word was made flesh. So there he was, this Word, in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he says, and then in verse 14 he says, And the Word was made flesh. And, and God now, the Word, took upon Himself human flesh and came to be a substitute for you and for me. And why would He do that? So that we may see how far we have strayed from God. You know, the Apostle Paul, he refers to God's law as the law of love. And I want to read that to you just in... Romans chapter, um, chapter 13, as the Apostle Paul speaks about the law. Notice here it says, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, kill, sorry, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And notice then verse 10 it says, Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. My friends, this is what love is. Love is not some wishy-washy feeling we get. Love is not just some sentiment we have toward others. Love is governed by principle, and it's the principle of God's commandments. That is what love is. So if I'm going to truly love someone, Well, I'm not going to steal from them. I'm going to be honest in my dealings. If I truly love someone, I'm not going to uh, misrepresent them or bear false witness against them. I'm going to give a true representation. If I truly love someone, I won't mistreat them. I'll honor them with dignity and respect that every person deserves. And if I truly love God, 
I'm going to have nothing before him. If I truly love God, I'll regard him as holy and his name as holy. If I truly love. And my friends, this is what the Bible teaches us in terms of, the, of, of God's commandment. It's the highest standard to govern morality that we have. And it's always been there, friends. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you've had time to, to, to listen to this or be exposed to this in your, in your times past. But I believe the Lord is speaking to you today. God desires you to live a purposeful life. God desires us to have a happy, a joyful, and a peaceful life. And we only have that when we realize that we can come back to God and come back to His compass, His direction through Jesus Christ. My friends, when Jesus paid with His death, God offered us mercy. You see, the law demands a penalty. The breaking of the law demands a penalty. That police officer, well, I had nothing to say when he said, your record says otherwise. And he wrote me out a ticket, and I got my ticket. The law demands a penalty if it's broken. And God knows there's nothing wrong with his law, friends. He knows the problem is within our hearts. He knows the problem is in your heart. And you may find yourself in a, a, a broken marriage, a marriage that has been suffering and, 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 and teetering on, on destruction, complete destruction. God can bring healing to that marriage. You may find yourself... Uh, hateful of even your parents. God can, can bring healing to your heart. He can bring forgiveness to your heart. He can bring healing to those relationships. You may find yourself in drug addiction, smoking or, or alcohol addiction. And the commandment says, you shall not kill. And yet we are killing ourselves with these things. My friends, I want you to know that God can bring healing into your heart and into your life and deliver you from that addiction. And he begins with mercy. He begins with forgiveness. And so the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And I want to just talk about that and just close here for you. You see, the Bible uses this word grace. And you know what grace means? In the Greek, it's the word charios. And it means loving kindness. It means goodwill. And it means favor. And the Bible says that God showed us loving kindness. When we have strayed from Him, when we have lost our way, God showed loving kindness. When we have been rebellious and destructive in all our ways, God showed favor. When we didn't deserve it, God showed His goodwill to us in that He sent His Son, His divine Son, the Word made flesh into the world, and He paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. My friends, so that we could become hateful toward that sin and that we could love God because He showed us mercy. And God could now rightfully dismiss our case because Christ has paid the penalty, the penalty that the breaking of the law demanded. Christ has paid that penalty on your behalf and on my behalf. And so the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. I want to talk about that grace as we finish up here now. I had another incident with the running with the Lord. I was uh, in the city of Sydney and I had some business in one of the buildings and so I thought I'd be very quick and not being able to find parking, I parked in, a, a parked in an area um, that was designated as a loading zone. That's where the trucks came to load up the trucks. I shouldn't have been parking there. And I knew if I parked there, I was breaking the law. And uh, so yet I was willing to risk it. And so uh, how foolish we are sometimes with the risks we take. And so I, I, I parked there and I ran quickly upstairs and I came back down and uh, only to find that there was a police officer ready to put pen to paper and write me a ticket. And I came over and my shoulders hung low and my head was low. What could I say, friends? The law condemned me. And so I walked over and she saw me to her right side, this police officer, and she said to me, is this your car? And I said, yes, officer. I'm sorry I parked there. I really shouldn't have. I knew I shouldn't have parked there and I was honest. I said, I just thought I'd take a moment just to run quickly into this building because there was no other parking. 
Um, so it's okay. And I expected the ticket. Well, you know, what God loves is when we are honest and accountable. Honest with ourselves and honest with God with the things that we do. Just like I was honest with that police officer. I admitted that I had done wrong. She turned to me. She looked at me. And instead of continuing to, continuing to write, she put a pen in the pocket, put her notebook away, and she said to me, get out of here and don't do it again, okay? And I just couldn't believe it. What music to my ears. And I just thanked her so much from the bottom of my heart. And I promised never to do it again. And my friends, that officer, even though I didn't deserve it, she showed grace toward me. She showed favor toward me when she didn't have to. She showed goodwill toward me when she didn't have to. She showed loving kindness toward me when she didn't have to. And my friends, this is what God has done for you and for me through Jesus Christ. Amen? This is what he's done for us. And so I was free to go. And with that freedom now, no longer did I want to park in loading zones or break the law anymore. And my friends, when God pardons your sin, he expects you to take up a new life with him. He offers you a new life through his mercy. Not that you would continue now to go and break his commandments, but in the words of Jesus in John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And my friends, this is good news, isn't it? How God can bring a change in our lives, a change in my life and a change in your life if you're willing to receive Jesus Christ as your, as your sacrificial substitute and your surety. And my friends, he will put his law in your heart and he does it through his mercy. And I wonder if you can consider just the sacrifice that he made for you. My friends, it was written in the prophets, even a thousand years before Christ came, David wrote of the fact that they would pierce his hands and his feet. You can read it, Psalm chapter 22, verse 16. Isaiah said he would be led as a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah 53, written 750 years before Jesus came. My friends, all the prophets spoke of the grace of God toward humanity through Jesus Christ. It's my desire to put my faith in him, as I have, since I experienced a new life with him, and I continue to do that, put my faith in him each day, and I appeal to you to put your faith in Jesus Christ too. Won't you do that today? And may God bless you as you see the loving God of creation, the God of grace and mercy. God bless you, friends, and we'll see you next time.